Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I wanna to talk to you about quitting and why it's actually really important. What I wanna to talk to you about today is one, why we don't quit, and two, why we should. Seems pretty simple, but it's actually more complicated than you might think. When we watch these like old crime movies or even recent crime movies, what do they say? They always say, okay, babe, one more job, right? It's always like, they're about to get away. They're about to live life happily ever after. Somebody calls them in and the bank robber has to do one more job. And then that's when he gets caught and all the shenanigans start to happen. And there's a reason for that, right? It's There's a piece of us that wants to keep going no matter what. I was talking to a friend about this the other day about fighters that often you see this too, because it's part of our identity that we are this thing, whatever that identity is that we put on, we feel like we can't quit. And so you see fighters that are at the top of their game should quit then, that's when it's the most difficult to quit because it's when you don't know what's next and then they hold on too long and start to lose and then they're having a terrible career rather than having potentially an defeated career. And so when it comes to quitting for myself, I've really given myself a lot more leniency in making these changes. And this is why I wanted to listen to the podcast and talk to you about it today, because there's a lot around this that I think is really important, whether it comes to books or jobs or movies, like we always feel like we have to hold on to things and we really don't. Okay, so the first thing I wanna to talk to you about is why don't we quit? And one of the big reasons why a lot of the times you don't quit is this sunk cost fallacy, which is pretty much this idea that we've invested already so much and because we've given this much, it's hard for our brain to register what could potentially be on the other side. So let's say it's law school, for example, you become a lawyer, you invested all this time to become a lawyer. And now that you are, if you don't like the job, it's hard for our brains to process, well, now I can't switch and become a YouTuber or something else because I put all this time, all this money, all this effort into this law career, so I might as well stick it out. Compared to thinking about it the other way, which is what is the cost of me staying in this career? What is the cost of my happiness, of my life, of the, the impact that I could have on the world staying in this job? We often see it from this negative perspective compared to what Annie Duke argues is the potential for upside, which could actually be crazy, but it's really difficult for our brain to process that piece of quitting. Another reason that she talks about why we often don't quit is the sense of identity. And I find this in myself a lot, this, this idea that we have that I'm not a quitter, that I'm gonna stick with this. I think especially for ambitious and driven people, we don't want to feel like we quit. We wanna feel like we stick it out with things, right? That we have perseverance, we have determination, we show up, even when we don't feel like it and we keep going, right? But I think this is a fine line and this is where the book is really helpful and listen to our podcast talking about this, diving into it, is figuring out what that line is. When should you grit and when should you quit? I felt this idea of identity and quitting with my previous career trying to be a musician, that it was like, I was like, it's always my career's one hit away. It's one TikTok video away. It's one whatever, it's the next thing. But if I looked at the evidence before in my life, I realized I didn't have a lot of evidence showing me that this was going successfully. It was this kind of delusional perspective of identity of having me really struggling to hang up the jersey because I'd wrapped so much of my sense of self around this one idea. And it's not just me, they see this all the time with athletes. This is why it's so difficult for athletes to retire because that's their sense of identity. You don't know anything else other than that thing. So to quit is almost threatening to identity. And so what she talks about is how can we do things more gently rather than feeling like we have to go all in and be a reflection on us? How can we kind of like dip our toe in, experiment, see where it's going, and then potentially if it's not working, quitting, leaving. The potential of leaving something actually gives you incredible upside if you find something else that might actually be where your leverage is. I've been listening to this guy, Alex Formosi, talk a lot, and he's a cool business guy. We're like the same age, but he's super successful. And he talks about like the difference between path A and path B is you could put in the same amount of effort for both, but because of your skills and the potential of that path, you might like zoom light years ahead just because the choice was correct. And so it's this idea of you choose, you gotta take action, right? And action is still an action, but taking an action and then looking at the information, listening to like your inner soul, is it moving you, is this moving the needle? And then making adjustments as you go, rather than just setting the goal and blindly following it and going for it. It's like start down the path. I heard Tom Billius say this one time and I thought it was really poet. He said, mistakes are the most information rich data source you can have. So the whole point is like, it's that you go for it, but then you iterate. You don't necessarily hold on to something. Unless you know in your heart of hearts, this is it, period, point blank, I'm going for it all out. That's great. But a lot of times I think it's about iterating little iterations here and there. It's not necessarily starting something. We know this too. This is the problem. You start something 
and then you start something else and you start something else and nothing really go anywhere. You have to stick with something enough so that you can see if it's working or not, but there is a real sauce, you know, a real art in knowing when to leave that thing. And the last piece of evidence I'm gonna throw at you, at least for this point, comes from Seth Godin, who I talk about all the time. And he talks about like how the success, to the victor go the spoils, right? A lot of the success go to the 1% of people who are really good at the thing. It's like, like you think of musicians, actors, blah, blah, blah. Almost 99% of like the wealth, success, accolades, impact, go to that 1% who do something really, really well. And then you have the wide tail of all the other people in there that are trying to make it. And so I've heard Seth Godin say this. I recently listened to, again, Alex Hermosi say this. This is something I've been thinking about a lot for myself, my own impact, my own career, is where can I have the biggest leverage, the biggest impact? In my own life, for the last year, I've been pursuing an MFA. That's a Master of Fine Arts. It's a writing programs that we have. They're pretty well-funded writing programs in the US. So I've put together my application materials. I spent two months in Malaysia, writing, working on my short stories on the applications. I had a spreadsheet where I had all the schools I was gonna to apply to, what the application materials were required, the different, I've been taking these online workshops to get professors, to get letters of recommendation. I was about 75% of the way done with the application process. I just had to pull the trigger, actually fill out the applications and send them in and pay the bills. And now that I'm about nine months, 10 months in to this kind of year long process, where next month I could start applying, I realized after thinking back on it, yes, I've invested all this time learning how to write, last nine months, all this money into, I've hired two writing coaches, I've had all this you know, money that I've invested into tools and online courses and things of that nature. But when I really took a step back, thinking about what I've learned so far compared to what I knew 10 months ago is a great deal more. And I think this is really important, Is getting that information and then acting on it and realizing as I was moving forward in this process, the more I started to like get closer to pulling the trigger on this thing, investing more and more and more, right? The more difficult it was for me to pull out of this because I'm starting to form my identity around it, that I'm going to be a writer, that I'm going to, you know, apply to these really prestigious programs. But the point being is that when I really zoomed out and looked at it, I did it, and this was inspired by Seth Godin, Alex Ramosi, was that I didn't think my greatest leverage was in just being a writer. And again, I think this is really important to think about what is your biggest piece of leverage, right? I started down this path. I started telling people about it. I started to form my identity around it and then changed my mind and said, now I have more information. I'm starting to really understand more what my skills are. I think what my passions are, what I'm good at. I still love writing. But I don't think if I continue more down this path, my edge is gonna be in writing alone. And so I decided to quit. I said, you know what? I'm gonna give up on this MFA dream. I'm gonna still take writing, but I'm gonna apply it to something else. And that's what I've been doing now recently is working on kind of like copywriting and some voiceover work and creating these little videos around it. And it's cool. And I think it kind of stacks these different skills on each other, but it took a long time of really kind of coming to grips with that idea of, I'm gonna quit this thing that I've invested a lot of time into. And this was a year, you know, a year's worth of effort to quit. I can't, you know, I'd imagine people that are in law school or other people that have invested a lot of other time in these other things, how difficult it is. But here's the thing, rather than continuing down this path for three, four years for the MFA program, now I have the potential, the freedom to pursue this other path, which I might be much more successful on much sooner and might actually be able to get into that 1% leverage piece from kind of stacking skills but I don't have the time or effort to do that if I'm in an MFA. And so again, these aren't easy decisions to do, but they can be incredibly important. The last piece of this that I wanna talk about is maybe a little bit less heavy as thinking about career and job and skill stacking, blah, blah, blah. But it's this idea around quitting entertainment, quitting books and quitting movies. This is just a little Kia-ism that I'm gonna throw out there see if it's helpful for you. I'm giving you the license from here on out to quit reading books before you finish them. There's something about picking up a book that feels like, for some reason, I'm not sure if it's cultural, I'm not sure if it's from my family, but I hope for the longest time, if I picked up a book, like I had to read it. I was like, okay, if I'm going into this thing and I get three quarters of the way in, halfway in, I gotta finish it. And for some reason, I never thought that I could quit a book. I don't know what dawned on me, but I realized after I read this book by Naval Ravikant, who I love, where he talks about how he's, he's constantly reading like 12 books at one time, because he'll read parts that he thinks are really good and then he'll kind of dip it and read, you know, start reading another book. And that was hugely helpful for me, realizing I've been reading this mystery book. It's by this amazing author and it got turned into a TV show. 
and I got about a quarter of the way in and it still hasn't hooked me. And I'm like, I'm not feeling it. I'm gonna dip out and read something else. And it was really freeing to say, I don't have to find out what happens at this mystery. I'm gonna Google it, figure it out, and then move on and find another book, right? There, we all have different, different things that we like, different types of genres, different authors, different styles. They gravitate towards us. And so I'm giving you that license here too, to quit as many books as you need to. It doesn't mean that you're a quitter if you leave halfway through. I went to the movies last night. I went to go see Joyride. It was this really funny movie. And I got about three quarters of the way through. And I honestly, no offense to the directors, I got kind of bored. And so I walked out and I just left the movie in the movie theater. And I went and called a friend and walked around the mall instead because it gave me my time back. And so that's that whole point is that if you quit things, what you get in return can sometimes be hugely helpful. And I know this sounds silly. You know, it's, it's not as big as the career piece, but I think there's something really beautiful about that of like quitting movies, quitting books. Like you can start something and if it isn't doing it for you, feel free to dip out because then you could find something just as good or even better probably after you do it. The difficult piece is knowing when to stick with something and knowing when to leave it. But that's only something you can figure out from doing a lot of journaling, doing the internal work, figuring out what it is for you. But I'm giving you license to quit. Doesn't reflect on you. I mean, if there's something that you want to do, stick with it. I've been doing this YouTube channel for almost a year now, seeing where it goes, but also the lessons to quit, there might be something better. The grass might actually be greener on the other side. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, and I'll check you on the next one. Peace.